all for being here. Of course, please feel free to keep filling in the lower seats. Um, we go here uh, for a debate. I, uh, I'm Michael Sanzibura. I'm the Dean of Students, and I will be acting as moderator. Uh, my job is basically to make sure that the previously agreed upon rules are followed. Um, but otherwise, I have no formal role um, or and to express formal opinions uh, of either side in the matter. Uh, I'll leave that to our two capable debaters. Um, so, without further ado, we're going to go ahead and open up. Um, first, uh, Brian Hill Klein um, uh, is here representing KSU Atheist United, Sage Gerard um, representing KSU Men, um, and we're going to be opening first with Sage's remarks. So hello, hello, thank you so much for having me. My name is Sage Gerard, I'm the founder and current president of KSU Men. It is a men's rights organization, and we have a, and before I get started with my opening remarks, I'd like to point out that we have a conference called Male Students in Peril coming up on November 1st. Just look for our banner in the Student Center. It looks like this. It has all the information you need to RSVP. Sunday is the last day to RSVP, so now or never. So, let's, so without further ado, let's get started. I'm here to argue that feminism got it wrong, but what do I mean by that? What I mean is that feminism as a political ideology is subject to scrutiny. And it's not just an idea in a vacuum. It has a normative and actionable element that has been causing damage to innocent people. And when we look at that damage and the lack of accountability and lack of integrity of the movement in action, we are left to conclude that it is not consistent with its purported goals and values. That's what I mean when I say feminism got it wrong. And the dictionary definition of feminism, which many people would like to cite, is not sufficient because it doesn't look at feminism for what it is, the verifiable actions. The dictionary alone just cites, in essence, popular usage of the term. So I'm going to be showing you social context and present, and the present actionable institution, the establishment of feminism, to show what the movement looks like in action. Back in November 24th of 2013, 7,000 feminist Argentine women swarmed and physically abused and sexually abused 1,500 men who were defending their cathedral from vandalism. It was a pro-choice, it was a pro-choice, uh, pro-life argument. However, the men were completely restrained, they did not retaliate, while feminists continu continuously violently beat them. And this was the, this is the latest in a stream of attacks dating back to 2008. The media coverage was such that it was very quiet, and if it were the other case, the other way around, where 1,500 women were battered by 7,000 men, the the reaction would have been completely different. In November 2012, at the University of Toronto, a violent feminist protest broke out to, to, in an attempt to stop speakers from speaking about issues affecting men and boys in school. These included Dr. Warren Farrell, Dr. J Janice Viamango, Dr. Paul Nathanson, and Dr. Catherine Young. All of them had a very, they had a non-feminist, that is non-ideological way of looking at gender, but that apparently is not allowed. Lizalyn Jacobs, she served as for under the implementation of the Violence Against Women Act, the attorney for the National Organization for Women, and the chief of staff in the Civil Rights Division. She was called on camera, assaulting an independent journalist named Ben Vonderheide. This, and this is a figure, a public figure, that is supposed to be reducing domestic violence, but yet she was caught committing violence on camera in the name of an ideological implementation of the law. So how deep does that go? In this building, you will find this poster. This poster is either on the fourth or fifth floor on the side facing the west parking deck, and it shows modern research of domestic violence. And this modern research shows that, in, that men and women commit domestic violence about reciprocal. And this is not a popular claim in feminist circles. The feminist claim that it appears in scholarship over and over and over again is that men use domestic violence as a means to establish dominance in a relationship and to preserve patriarchal power over their partner. But this is not the reality. The reality is that men and women are just as capable of violence, and we need to have programs that are equitable and are able to help both male and female victims of violence. So the presumption of male malice is something that hurts both men and women in the long run. 
Now, Dr. Murray Strauss, Dr. Richard Jales, and Dr. Susan Steinmetz are all pioneers in domestic violence to research. They were the first ones to come up with a nationally representative survey showing that men and women are, have equal capacity for violence and commit domestic violence at about the same rates. Again, this was not a popular claim among feminist circles, and they have all reported in, peer, in their peer review papers that they have been subjected to bomb threats and death threats by feminists. Murray Strauss was shouted out of the, the University of Massachusetts when he was given a presentation. The chair of the Canadian Commission of Violence Against Women has accused Murray Strauss of misogyny, wife beating, and sexually exploiting students. And graduate students under Strauss had their careers threatened. Susan Steinmetz had her tenure threatened, and it goes on. <clears throat> excuse me, and it goes on in this nature. Aaron Pitsy, a prominent figure in the women's movement, in 1971 found Chiswick's Women's Aid, now known as Refuge, in London. She was operating on the same modern domestic violence research. Feminists came and shot her dog, and on top of that, threatened to pull her book, Prone to Violence, from bookshelves and destroy them. Erin Pitsy ended up having to flee the country when the government told her, we need to start screening your mail for unexpected packages. So, and again, this is the marital violence indexes for 1985 U.S. and 1987 Alberta surveys. Murray Strauss noticed that any information showing women as perpetrators of violence was deleted. You can see here, that bullet point B, somebody selected that text and hit backspace. And this went into peer review research, and he published a paper showing that this kind of censorship is pervasive, despite evidence showing reciprocity in domestic violence. And that is done primarily by feminists seeking to preserve their ideological commitments over their scientific commitments. This moved on to influence government policy. It influenced the way we look at men and women. This is institutional corruption. And for those of you who think I'm just focusing on the fringe or extreme portions of feminism, fail to understand I'm not looking at just incidental feminists, I'm looking at influential feminists. The ones who represent the movement in action. M Mary Koss, in 1987, she, po she published in her paper that she willingly ignored, did not include in her definition men who were victims of rape by female rapists. And her study, she, in her studies, she also included women who were not raped as rape victims, and through doctored numbers, has put out the very popular statistic that one in four or one in five, depending on who reports it, women will be raped or sexually assaulted in their lifetime. This is a false statistic that has been discredited, but yet it still remains cited by government and by academic programs. And her methodology is still used today. And this shows that feminism, it, as an institutional presence, is causing harm and introducing inequities in spite of the way it markets itself. This is the United States Department of Education April 4th Directive, also known as the Dear Colleague Letter. In this letter, it is reducing the standard of evidence from a beyond reasonable doubt or clear and convincing standard of evidence for accusations of sexual assault and rape to a preponderance standard that is 51%. So, in the event that you as a man on this campus, because this is nationwide, if you are on this campus and you're accused of sexual assault and rape in, in, in internal university investigations, you may be subjected to a disciplinary action, even though a criminal accusation was made against you, but civil standards of evidence, which shows that it's more likely you did it than not, ends up saying that you should be convicted. So even if you never did anything wrong, there's still a chance that you could be convicted, largely due to cultural values and the way we interpret men and women today. This clear inequity is not addressed by feminists today, even though there's an opportunity for them to repair their integrity by looking at it. And for, for, to get an idea of the kind of environment this creates, you may have heard of the Duke Lacrosse case, and in the Duke Lacrosse case, these three young men were subjected to a false rape accusation and a smear campaign by 88 professors. And a Wendy Murphy, who uh, was working on the case, said, quote, stop with the presumption of innocence, it doesn't apply to Duke. When they make administrative decisions about student behavior, they don't owe them any due process, unquote. And this kind of thing can be found in multiple universities. And I, I do not have enough time to cover everything, but it's most certainly there. And for more, in, for more on inequities that feminists could address but don't, let's bring it closer to home. This is from Section 16-6-1 of the OCGA, Georgia State Law. Georgia State Law says that only a man can rape a woman. This flies in the face of reality where anybody can rape anybody. And yet, he, he has common knowledge of a female forcibly against her will, and what it says below that's been cropped out due to image size problems was that uh, it's when a female sex organ is penetrated by a male sex organ. Homosexual rape doesn't happen. 
And on top of that, heterosexual rape committed by a woman doesn't happen. This is in state law. It's a clear inequity, yet there is no feminist movement that I have seen, through all the research I've done for several years, that there's any institutional effort to correct this. Because trying to correct this, this inequity would be, would, and in some way, contradict the ideological commitment that men are bad. That men are bad and women are good. Women are victim and men are the bad guys, twirling their mustaches, trying to establish dominance and oppression over women. And again, I'm not looking at fringe feminists, I'm looking at famous feminists. I'm looking at feminists who have had institutional power and feminists who have, are their journalists, their authors, their scholars. These are people with a capacity to influence our lives, a capacity to decide where our institutions go. And if you look at what's happening today, you see that feminism, through the publication of literature and through the censorship of people in the peer review process, we are left with a very ideological presence. And the only thing that's keeping them doing this is the fact that we all want to believe it's a good thing. We just want to. There is such a thing as a humanitarian non-feminist. Somebody who is concerned about equity and wants to include both men and women in the discussion on who is a victim and who needs help, but without being monitored and without being judged or censored under feminist tyranny, which is present in academia and which is influencing funding today. So I'm not, we're looking at a community of celebrities, people who identify as feminists and who have a very strong grip over our emotions. We want to believe that we're doing a good thing by believing in it. We want to believe that feminism is a positive aspect of our lives. And if we just keep trying to prove that it's right, maybe, may, just maybe, we'll end up with an equitable society. But there's too much damage. Too many inequities have been introduced. And on top of that, with the inequities introduced, there are other inequities that feminism might not have caused, but they aren't making an effort to correct if it contradicts their ideological conviction of the presumption of male privilege, power, and malice. So why will we ever ask ourselves, is it possible for us to support an equitable society without having to be ideologically committed, committed to this word? Feminism is something that has become so ingrained in our cultural values that we are scared to challenge it. And those of us who really want to believe in it we're scared to challenge it as well because we've invested so much into it. But I'm telling you right now, what if this if feminism were a movement run by men for the sake of men, we wouldn't be buying it today. There's a very very serious emotional commitment that we have to it, as I said. And when you look at and I'm I'm assuming that when I hear the opening statement, we're going to hear about some of the good feminists have done, and I wouldn't deny that. But you can also find good committed on the part of hate movements in the past. If you, you can look at even the Ku Klux Klan in the past century. You've seen that they've done community service work. But that doesn't change the fact that it is a hateful organization that has done hateful things. And that's why we don't trust it today. The same thing can be said about feminism. You can look at the good things it's done. You can look at suffrage. You can look at increased participation in the workforce. But that is not adequate. If you look at the current, present damages done today, you find it is not consistent with its purported goals and values. And that's what I mean when I say feminism got it wrong. I'd like to yield the rest of my time to rebuttals.
event to uh, Matthew. We lost a scholar a few weeks ago, and uh, he'll all, he'll never be forgotten in my mind. And uh, every event this year, I'm going to mention him, how much I loved him, and uh, how much he's missed. These are my daughters, Cosette and Catherine. Uh, Catherine is eight, Cosette is six. And I didn't really think too much about feminism before they were born. I had, you know, I, I, I had never really had anything against them, but uh, I had never really thought about how the world will be when my daughters grow up. You know, and I started thinking, you know, do I want them to have rights like voting? Do I want them to be able to make the same amount of money for the same job when they have the same education? Because that today, my friends, is not the case. We've heard a lot about this. There is an inequality in America. Sage has talked a lot about Canada and other places. Um, and, and I definitely want to say that I appreciate Sage. Uh, Sage came over to my house and helped me actually move some of my stuff from my former uh, wife's house to my new apartment. And Sage is a great guy. I've heard a lot of trash talking about him on this campus. Um, but Sage has the freedom of speech. And, that, and a lot of people would like to hamper my freedom of speech, but the freedom of speech means nothing unless it protects the person who thinks differently. You know, and for that reason, I think that we should applaud Sage for coming up here and speaking his mind and being a, a scholarly student. Although, I think that I completely disagree with almost everything he said. Okay, whenever we walk into something like this, we want to define the topic. What is feminine? What is it? What is the definition of wrong? So we'll start out with feminism. Feminism, um, the definition varies greatly depending on the source. Though this is the case, by looking at a wide array of definitions of feminism, we may be able to come to a consensus on our meetings. Like, what my view of feminism may be versus what Dr. Morgan's may be versus what Dr. St. Barrow's may be, may be different things, but there must be some type of cause commonality in the three, um, in, in our three definitions. Um, so I wanted to start with Mary Wollstonecraft, and one of her great quotes was, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. This is what I've, what has been referred to in the past as first wave feminism. Um, but, it, but again, it, the first wave starts out with equality. Then we move to Gloria Steinem, who says, a feminist is anyone who recognizes the equality and full humanity of women and men. And then I'd like to move to the OED. I'm an English major, so that's kind of my forte. The OED says that feminism um, is the advocacy of equality of the sexes, the establishment of the political, social, and economic rights of female sex, and the movement associated with this. Now, the other part of our topic is defining it and wrong. It would be illogical to argue that feminism got itself wrong. That would be like saying Brian got himself wrong. So I don't think that's what Sage is arguing, so we'll go ahead and skip that. Um, one could argue that, that people advocating for feminism's ideologies do not represent feminism, but that's not the topic today either. Common criticisms of feminism, and you can find this in the KSU Sentinel um, under the uh, article a few weeks ago uh, about Sage, Sage and a Voice for Men. Because we, we hear about how men lose court cases via alimony, child custody, domestic violence cases, and false rape accusations. One in five women will be sexually assaulted in their lifetime. I've got two little girls. That means if I have three more, that one of my daughters will be raped or sexually assaulted, and I'm not okay with that. 
Men do not have the same academic opportunities in academia due to feminist bias. This was also talked about in the KSU article that there were LGTB rights and that there were black studies and that there were LGTB studies, but there were no men's studies. Now, as an English major, I can assure you that most books I have read in my three years at KSU were not only written by men, but they were written by white men, including the Bible. Number three, in the KSU article, it talks about martial art classes and unisex bathrooms are almost exclusively female oriented. Now, let's move on to these things. In, in English, we have what's called the straw man fallacy, where we build up this straw man and we say, attack this for your problems. But have you ever seen a scarecrow? A scarecrow can't do anything unless we're talking about the wizard. And this is what I believe my opponent and his advocacy group has done. They want to say, hey, look at, look at the false accusations. And, and there are false accusations of rape. And there are men raping men and then men accusing men falsely of rape, too, I'd like to point out. Especially in prison. But nobody likes to talk about that. But, this, but these problems of, of alimony, of, of having... Uh, court cases and, and the, the woman always wins domestic violence. Is that a problem that this straw woman of feminism can fix? Or is this something that the legal system can fix? Who holds the responsibility for false rape accusations, ladies and gentlemen? Is it feminism? Or is it the legal system? Who can do something about it? Feminism? Or the legal system? Now, the same holds true with academia. Yes, maybe there should be a men's rights classes on campus. But even if that is true, feminism cannot create a men's rights class on this campus. It has to be academia. Sansa Vero might be able to get one created, but feminism cannot. <laughs> now, as far as unisex bathrooms, and self-defense courses, I'm going to tell you, that's a facility manager's job, and that's a self-defense course instructor's job to make it more geared. It's not the problem of feminism. Okay? Feminism is essentially an ideology. It's the idea that men and women should be treated fairly and equal, no matter where they are or what they do. Ideologies in and of themselves cannot do anything. And we can talk about ISIS. Maybe they have their ideologies wrong, because not every Muslim is, is an ISIS member. Not every Christian is a Westboro Baptist Church member. Not every atheist goes around like an idiot saying God is dead. I assure you, I know a few that do, and I tell them, shut up. You're making us look bad. Because that that is getting your ideology wrong. And there are times where where feminists have got it wrong. I'm not saying that all feminists are right all the time. If you call yourself a feminist, you get a carte blanche chant, check to do whatever you want to. I heard of one feminist who said that all intercourse or all penetration is rape. And I'm like, okay, how are we going to continue to be a human species? And, uh, <laughs> test tube babies, and a lot of science. Okay. But I mean, there are things that I'm like, okay, I, I mean, I've met feminists who are like, hey, I, hey, I'm a feminist, but hey, the bra burning, hey, I don't want to burn my bra, but I'm a feminist. So there are de definitely various degrees of feminism. I mean, obviously, I don't even have a bra to burn. Maybe I do. <laughs> <laughs> but the actions of the adherence of an ideology, the actions of, a, of the adherence of an ideology cannot be blamed upon the ideology itself. I want to go to Christopher Hitchens here, and I want you to read this. The Cure for Poverty has a name in fact. It's called the empowerment of women. If you give women some control over the rate at which they reproduce, if you give them some say, take them off the animal cycle of reproduction to which nature and some doctrine, religious doctrine, condemns them, then you throw in a handful of seeds and perhaps some credit that dwarf everything in that village. Not just poverty, but education, health, optimism will increase. It doesn't matter. Try it. Try it in Bangladesh. Try it in Bolivia. It works. It works all the time. Poverty of 
affects men. And the only way to cure poverty, according to Christopher Hitchens, is the empowerment of women. You make them equal. You let them vote. You let them have babies when and if and where and when they want to. And I'm telling you that that will increase the floor of your society. Now, is men's rights an issue? Yes, it is. I'm a man, and there are certain issues that I definitely would prefer Sage to advocate for. I don't think that the rights of any person should be taken away. For instance, is it okay that when I was a baby I was circumcised against my will? We sure don't like it in Somalia whenever they cut off the labia of little girls. But it's okay here in America to just circumcise every little boy as soon as he's at the doctor's office. That's a men's rights issue. But just to be a purely antithetical position against feminism, I'm just an anti-feminist, is not the right way to promote your ideology. My conclusion, feminism is an ideology, essentially. Ideologies cannot be blamed for what people do in its name. Men's rights cannot be blamed for what SAGE does. I've, I've heard of people in the men's rights group going around recording women against their knowledge and then posting it online. What I don't understand is why a student doesn't turn to this person and say, do not ever contact me again. If you do, I will call the police. And they turn around and walk away. And if that person even says, I'm sorry, or follows them, they may easily call one of our great officers here who will take the matter quite seriously, I assure you. Feminism did not get it wrong because it is a force for good in the world, allowing equality of the sexes, not advocating for one sex to be dominated over the other. Okay? I'm a feminist, and I hope that Sage and yourself will join me in this great movement. Okay? That's the end of my. Thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. I split the uh, remainder of my time between rebuttals and Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Now before I begin my rebuttal, I would like to take just a quick moment to do what I neglected to do during my opening statement and to thank both the staff of Atheist United and Dr. Sansevero and the faculty and staff at Kennesaw State University for setting up this event and giving me the opportunity to speak. Now regarding, now there are several points that Brian brought up and unfortunately the entire opening statement which was basically used for rebuttals was a gish gallop, a sequence of, of sentiments and statements that are false that ended up trying to reframe the discussion in a way that supports his point, even though there is no evidence to support it. Starting with the wage gap, for example, if you look at the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you, you will find that the average earnings between men and women is about 30, the, the difference is about 33 cents, but when you compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges, there is no wage gap. It doesn't exist. If you look at the statistics from the Independent Women's Forum and Learn Liberty, you find the wage gap being based on discrimination is a myth, and I will leave that to your research. There is also the emphasis stressing that there is no discussion of America, which I appreciate. But I wanted to mention that this is an international problem to show you that this is not just a Eurocentric problem. This is something that happens worldwide, and I will be discussing America a little more. Now, there was a lot of semantic arguments made here about defining feminism by the dictionary, which is, in essence, an appeal to popularity, since lexicographers write dictionaries according to what people commonly understand something. 
But mob rule is not truth. Mob sentiment is not truth. There is also the genetic fallacy, appealing to a history context, an origin context, to transfer feeling about feminism to the present when that's not the context in question. There's also, in essence, saying that not all feminists are like that, or there's no, not a real feminist that would do certain things. That's no true Scotsman fallacy. And finally, there was also misappropriating the position about unisex bathrooms. When KSU men and the men's rights and presence on campus never once complained about unisex bathrooms. That never once got brought up. So this is a misrepresentation of the position. Although I do, I am glad that Brian did bring up America, because when it comes to the legal system, one of the points I've been making is that feminism co-opted the institutional presence. It is ideologically driven. And if you look at Vladek Filler and Nicholas Alabertian, two men who have been hurt by the legal system by feminist values, by a corrupt prosecutor named uh, Mary Kellett over in Hancock County, Maine, subjected Vladek to a violation of due process, withheld exculpatory evidence, according to Dogma. Feminism, it, to say that feminism is not responsible for any of this is to say that an idea cannot be behind any atrocities, which I think is a surprising statement to hear. When, we've discussed, when we all know that there are hateful movements, hateful institutions, that do operate on ideas and translate them into action. Ideas do not exist in a vacuum in politics, and it's fallacious to assume that it is. And I would like to ask that you all base your evaluations on facts and not sentiments, because that's going to be very important to see the truth. And I'll dedicate the rest of my time to the Q&A. Again, I disagree with Sage. Ideas cannot do things. Nazi ideology did not kill the Jews. Hitler did. Marxism is not responsible for Stalin. Stalin is. Not Marx. And now, during this Q&A session, I have the opportunity to ask Sage certain questions. And I am going to take that opportunity now. Sage Garrard, what is your position on male circumcision? Is it a men's right issue? And if so, what is your stance on it? Thank you so much. Um, circumcision is a human rights issue. It's not something that you can restrict it to men. And it's in a way that people can support ending circumcision period. Both little boys and little girls, babies, are, can be subjected to genital mutilation, which is what circumcision is. So I oppose it outright. Since male circumcision, circumcision cannot happen to females, it is by definition a man's right issue. And that's all, that, I mean, that's just logic to me, Sage. Um, next question I'd like to ask you is, have you recorded women against their knowledge on campus and then posted those recordings online? What I do as a men's rights activist is when I perform advocacy work, largely in public venues, I record my own advocacy, such that I, for my own protection, since this is not a politically fashionable thing for me to do, I need to be very wary of possible threats of physical violence that could be made against my person. And when I'm in a public venue, men or women can appear, either on camera or in audio recordings, in a public venue with no reasonable expectation of privacy. And it's completely legal for me to do that. So yes, I have made recordings in public venues with no reasonable expectation of privacy for the purposes of advocacy and for the benefit of the community. And there is measurable benefit to be found with that. Thank you very much. Mr. Gerard, are you, are you aware that some women on campus uh, require the uh, DPS or police protection to go from their cars to their classes and then from their classes to their cars because of their fear and intimidation of you? Any fear or intimidation is unwarranted. However, 
I would like to stop. I would like to stop for a second and ask a question in return. There is Kennesaw State University Men is an organization that has been working on gender equity in a more positive aspect. And I can see here that the conversation is trying to be framed in a way to put me on the defensive and to build a straw man in my position to, to make it appear as if I'm a monster. But men's rights activists are monsters, which is expected. This is the kind of thing that happens. Distract, it's a red herring. Distract, the, distract everybody from the issue at hand and to not be held accountable, and to not work on equity that is verifiable and damage done by feminists. Why is it that there needs to be a chance to reframe the discussion, Brian? Say as you have passed your rebuttal time on to Q&A, so I don't have to answer your questions. This is my rebuttal time, I get to ask you. I am not saying anything about men's rights activists or all men's rights activists, I'm asking you directly, number one, did you report women on campus? You said you did. Number two, are you aware that women are so afraid of, the, of you that they have to be escorted from their cars to their class and back by DPS and security? You obviously avoided that question. So I'm gonna ask you again. Are you aware that there are women on this campus who will not leave their car because you and go to class without protection because they are intimidated by you. I am aware of that feeling. I am aware that they do that. So yes. However, that is not my responsibility. The way that, is, that, way that advocacy is interpreted is not something that I can be held responsible for. And if there are women on campus who feel intimidated by ideas, that speaks to the level of cultural insecurity that can be found on campus. And that can speak to the level of cultural insecurity that is used to try to reframe the issue and to dodge the verifiable evidence that there is a very evil presence in the way we look at men and women today. So the answer is yes. Thank you for your candor. Sage, my next question is going to be this. Is there any chance that you would apologize to the women that you've intimidated and swear that you won't do this sort of thing anymore? I'm going to have to challenge the question. It's a loaded question. It's in essence saying that I intended to intimidate, when that is not true. Rather, anything that I have done, even especially recording, is done for fear of my own safety, for fear of what might happen to me, since other people in my position have been intimidated and harassed just for talking about issues affecting men and boys. So the question is loaded. And, in addition, I would not and never will apologize for caring about gender equity on campus or, in the, or on this plan. Thank you, Sage. <clears throat> um, I was over there looking at the paper where, because I know that somewhere in the article it talks about unisex bathrooms. I wanted to ask Sage, um, because I have a group on campus and we get pressed to, some's been good, some's been bad, you know, that's just how it goes. You know, but um, in the article it talked about how uh, A Voice for Men is not a hate group, but had been investigated by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group. And I would like to see um, if you would like to spend a minute uh, talking about that. Sure thing. Now, um, since I've given a minute for the for question time, I don't think I'm going to be able to give the full answer. But the very short, the short of it is that somebody who does not work for the SPLC, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and do not has do not does not hold a title, has from an opinion piece listed the website of Voice for Men as a hate website, or rather a misogyny, not an article called Misogyny in the Science. However, if you look at the Southern Poverty Law Group's official publications on what is a hate group, you will find that a voice for men is not listed as such. But yet, people want to look at the opinion of Arthur Goldwag as an official statement by the SPLC, even though it was mentioned twice that it wasn't. That rumor spread to KSU, and it has influenced the way we look at things. Now, if we you now looked at the Sentinel, and the one that says that the a voice for men is not a hate group, that's a news piece. The ones who do say that it is a hate group are, again, opinion pieces. And this opinion, and this wish 
to see men's rights advocates, ugh, activist organizations as bad is just a sentiment. It's an emotional reaction that is not based in reason. Thank you, Susan. There's a CDC statistic that says that one in five women will be raped in their lifetime. Do you believe that to be the case? Not even remotely. As I said, Dr. Mary Koss is the source of the statistic, and she has been found by peer-reviewed research to doctor numbers. Here, here in the article it says that AF, AFVF insists that 92 out of 102 rape cases are false accusations. Do you believe that to be true? Paul Leland, the founder of A Voice for Men, has made a statement to this effect. In the interview, he says that no one actually knows the, false, the, the actual number. This probably came from an article on A Voice for Men, which is not actually representative of the organizational position. The organizational position is that no one really knows, but just like with rape, a false rape accusation, one is too many. Do you think that feminism in and of itself holds any value? I believe that it did, but it no longer does. How did it? When it did. The value that any movement of that nature can bring to the table is it pretty much instills a level of self-assertion. Even if something is not based in fact, it can still get somebody wanting to rise up and make a change. And even if I oppose feminism on, a, on account of its claims and on the institutional presence it's created, I think that wanting to stand up for yourself is a wonderful value to get, and you can find that anywhere, whether it be based in reason or not. In this article, we, we talked about um, self-defense classes. Do you believe that men are assaulted by women, or women assault men more often? I believe that women and men, according to the, mo the modern research, commit violence reciprocally. And that's in the scope of interpersonal violence. But on campus, I have seen women assault men, and I even challenged a woman on campus who did that. And she said, oh, he can't hit back. That was the response. And that also reflects the cultural attitude of the day. So I believe that um, it is not accurate to say that men uh, attack women more often, because the research shows that this is not the case. But there is corruption in publications, in peer-reviewed publications, that try to paint men as the primary perpetrators of all violence in terms of men and male and female relations. OK. And, and there's nowhere in here that talks about unisex bathrooms, right? The only time a unisex bathroom is mentioned was when I made an analogy stating that the Women's Resource and Interpersonal Violence Prevention Center has gynocentric, a gynocentric publication. So basically I said, it's kind of like if a unisex restroom taped a women's sign over the over. It's just an analogy. I did not actually complain about unisex bathrooms. I apologize, I misread that. Do you think that men should be instructed on how to defend themselves against women? I think men should be instructed on how to defend themselves without being told that they are responsible all for all violence against women, which is something that the rape aggression defense, uh, resisting aggression with defense for men, of course, advocates. Again, with the courses, do you think there should be a men's rights course here? I think there should be a men's rights presence like KSU men, but are you asking more in terms of the self defense? Here in the article, you talk about how there's LGTB studies and there's black studies, but there's no men's studies. That, that, that was more or less to which I was referring. Okay. Well, I, I think that it's best to have a presence, a representation, that does not assume that men are a problem that needs to be fixed. So I would say there would need to be a men's rights element, or rather a men's sensitive element in gender studies that looks at the problems that affect men honestly, and that does not need the approval of feminist ideology, particularly in the social sciences. Okay. As last part of my rebuttal, I want to say that uh, KSU Atheist United will probably have a, an event coming up very soon that will be very big here at KSU. Lastly, I want to say that Morgan came to be my debate partner. Sage's debate partner couldn't be here, and I request that she be given the first question. So wait, I'm 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 a little confused. Were you right? Were you asking? Were you asking another question for me to address? No, I'm, I was saying that Morgan. You know how we were going to do two for two. Uh -huh. Morgan's not a speaker, so she's by by, by default an audience member. Sure. And I think that she should be given the opportunity to ask the first and maybe the first two questions. The, the, the audience might accept it. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we'll respond to that.
actually, as we get into Q and A, just so everyone knows, this will be open opportunity for anyone to ask any questions, either party or both parties. Uh, if you'd like both to address your question, then you can specify that you'd like a response to both. Uh, if you would only like to address it to one specific individual, you're welcome to do that. Um, the other thing that I'll just say, um, too, uh, obviously there's been a lot of discussion um, about uh, speculation with things to uh, policy, procedure, and all of that. Um, if anyone ever has any questions about the university's official policies and procedures or stances, um, we're absolutely welcome to email those to dean of students at kennesaw.edu, and I'll be happy to get you a response to those. Um, but I will not be, uh, as a moderator, I will not be responding to specific questions today, but I know that sometimes questions come up in these venues um, related to policy and procedure, and I wanted everyone to know that you always have an opportunity to get a response to those. Thank you. All right, so, okay, so this question is addressed to Sage. Um, so my first question would be, um, you say that KSU Men's Rights is an advocacy, um, an activist group, um, as well as feminism. Um, so my question was, is if feminism is wrong, and if feminism got it wrong, then how is your organization any less wrong? What we do is we specialize in issues affecting men and boys because men and boys have been neglected under feminist ideology and under the feminist establishment. And again, feminism has spilled into academia and government. It affects those policies and it even affects how money flows and how we interpret men and women today. So when I say that KSU Men is an organization that advocates for egalitarian sentiment, just like feminism claims it does, but what we're doing is we're specializing in the neglected sex basically to catch up on the mess that's been left but no one cleaned up. So second question would be, because well, it wasn't really answered, so there is no difference between feminism and KSU men's rights, ideology-wise, opposite, but as, in terms of advocacy, they are doing the same thing, just different ways. I'm glad you brought that up, because if the KSU men is a non-feminist organization in sent us, it's non-ideological. You're asking about, you're presuming that an ideology exists in KSU men as an organization. There isn't one. Okay, hi, my name is Shannon Mitchell. Um, I believe your name is Morgan. Yes. Okay, um, but basically to piggyback, oh, no, the question is for you, Sage. Um, to piggyback off of her question, I have the exact same question because this whole time you've been talking about um, gender, you said equity, not equality, but it's basically from what you said, from the context clues I got, that it was the same thing. So gender equity. So I felt like your group is basically feminist, you're just more focused on men. If the definition, like we said, the popular construction of it, as you like to mention it as, is the, the equality of men and women, you want to see equality for men as well. But my question is, if your organization is based on making sure that men get what they have been withheld from, basically, that they get their rights and that they're treated equally as well, how is that not an ideology? If it's not based on an ideology, then what is it based on? Well, we, we can base our understanding of equity on context. So if, if you can either look at things according to ideology, where you look at a single framework of thought, and you just commit to that framework of thought, and you reference it whenever you see a problem. Or you can look at context, such that whenever you see a problem, you evaluate the current damages and the current responsibilities that you see around it, and then you suggest a solution based on context. So in that light, I'm, and again, I'm glad you brought this up as well, when you look at the, at the evolution of feminism and its developing establishment, they have a very static worldview. Even though people like to mention feminism as a heterogeneous ideology, it really has very core premises that presume male privilege and male malice, whereas a context-centric approach would say, men are having it rough right now under this establishment, but if that were to change, we wouldn't need to have that idea anymore. So context controls the way we look at things, not ideology. Um, I would also like to mention that we talked about the possibility of there being classes on men's rights and things as such. I can tell you that there is a class on masculinity. It's under Gender and Women's Studies. Um, if you want to look it up, all the classes are up right now on Al Express. But I would also like to ask, mention, kind of along the same thing. Um, first, I'd like to give an example because I feel like my question is going to be confusing. But I know sometimes I've heard people have problems with historically black colleges. But me personally, my opinion is that that was because we weren't allowed in any other colleges, so we had to start our own. So I, from what you said, you know, you feel like feminism got it wrong, blah, blah, blah. 
but that came from somewhere because women were being were being treated unjustly, are being treated unjustly. So you said that there wouldn't be a need for men's activist groups and these type of things if men were treated correctly, right? That would just go away. But the feminist movement started because women haven't been treated right. So men might start to be treated right again, and then there wouldn't be a need for these type of organizations, as you just said. But what about the fact that women still need to be treated a certain way? I understand that you have the right for freedom of speech, as he mentioned, and to advocate for your point, your different opinions for your group, but you're apparently going about it a certain way for different students to feel the need to be protected on campus. If it was just you stating your opinion as facts, then there wouldn't be this group of girls that feel personally attacked. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. What are you confused about? I hear. There's a lot of things that you cover, yeah. and I'd like to just start briefly by mentioning the Masculinity Studies on campus. I already talked about that in an interview with Sentinel. The Masculinity Studies course has readers like, it has a required reading by individuals like Michael Kimmel, who again presume that masculinity is more of a problem that needs to be fixed. They particularly use the angry white male stereotype in order to rehash tired old propaganda. And in addition, a, a, a masculinity studies, including one, does not change the fact that it is seen through a feminist lens. You can have a class on, you can have a class on blacks, gays, Latinos, or what have you, but that doesn't mean you're diverse if it's all seen through the same lens. So the, there is no real presence for, men, for men's issues on campus because it's not seen through a lens that's sympathetic to them. Does that make sense? Okay. Now regarding women feeling intimidated. But the thing that you mentioned, you, you insinuated that I was not just stating my opinion. But that is what I've been doing. I, in fact, a lot of the things that happened, a lot of the controversy that stirred up around KSU men, started when I started criticizing feminism. Only then did people start showing up. Only then did people start making false accusations against my character and my conduct. That shows you that this is, we here on Kennesaw State University are an example of my point that the culture is very much so attached to this word, is so attached to the sentiment, that it's almost like a dark ages situation, where if you're not part of this, of basically this ideology of the day, people are gonna ask, what's wrong with you? They don't ask what you mean. And then they assume that they need protection, even though there's nothing to fear to begin with. Does anybody, I don't know. Uh, I have a question for uh, Brian Klein. Yes, sir. How, um, when feminism has such a negative stance on masculinity, a man's nature, uh, and has just this general distrust of any men that are power, how, how can that, how do we keep feminism accountable from those beliefs just bleeding into bigotry against men? I disagree with the premise of your question. I don't believe that, fe that feminism is about what you say it is. I, I disagree with the premise, the premise of your question, if you want to restate. Well, um, obviously there have been uh, influential fe feminists that uh, Sage has put in uh, his his PowerPoint. Andrea Dworkin is one of them, which I have seen her in academic papers and taking very, yeah, very yeah, seriously. Yeah, the one who says that all penetration is right. Yeah, I saw that. How, you know, how can I feel, feel like it's just a, such a fair movement when bigots like that are taken seriously and that is influencing Just as policy. Westboro Baptist Church does not represent Christian theology, that woman does not represent feminist ideology. She is on the extreme of the, of the movement and she does not represent the mainstream of feminists who are like my wife, who are like the ladies here. You're trying to judge everybody by the worst of them. And I'm sure it's convenient for, for your belief system, but that doesn't mean it's correct. All right. Uh, my name is John Blaney with KCL Radio. Uh, I have a question for Brian. You mentioned in your, uh, I believe in your Q and A, that let's see, find it here, that 
there is a sense of fear and intimidation by women uh, on campus uh, against SAGE. Do you have any reported documentation of this, uh, the amount that it's happened or anything uh, no, like that? No, sir. I'm not done with my question quite yet. Um, any documentation about that? And if so, where can I get that documentation? I'm sorry, I do not have documentation of it. I asked Sage about it directly, and he confirmed it. So you can use that as your documentation. But there are no reports like the KSUPD or anything like that, where they needed an escort or anything like that. You would have to ask the. You, you have the right to ask the Kennesaw Police Department um, through the Freedom of Information Act and do your own research, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mike. I was just wondering how asking about the sorry, the intimidation question was even relevant to the topic. Because to we're, we're talking about them. doing ideologies right and wrong, like like I was using atheist, some atheists as an example, that ISIS and Westboro was an example, that I was up, but then I I, I parlayed that to say that this what what's going on on this very campus is an example of getting men's rights ideology wrong. I disagree with Sage. I believe that feminism is an ideology. I believe that men's rights is an ideology. I think that both should be protected. That both should be promoted in the correct way. For, for the longest time on this campus, it could have easily been said that Brian Klein promoted atheism incorrectly. I was never called a hate group, but I was hated by groups of people, <laughs> large groups of people, and I've tried to, to tone down my rhetoric, and I've tried to do better by my KSU um, fellow scholars and by my professors, and I've tried to do better by the membership of KSU Atheists United by becoming a more positive type of ideology, and I was only using SAGE and the, and asking him those types of questions about intimidation and stereotypically recording women as an example. Hopefully it'll be quick. Um, you mentioned about responsibility and how, if I remember right, you pointed to say the court system as being responsible for changing things. Um, isn't, the re isn't it the responsibility of everyone to fight inequalities? Uh, isn't singling out, say, the ju judicial system a way to remove responsibility from others? Cons and considering issues aren't addressed until brought forward by the public and aren't addressed arbitrarily from within, where does the responsibility come from? Again, the responsibility for false rape accusations, alimony, child support, domestic violence, all lie within the legal system because they're the only people that can do anything about it. Yes, there should be an outcry to, for justice. The legal system is also known as the justice system. And if there is injustice happening in the justice system, it should be railed against. And I mean, that, that, I mean I, I'm not a big fan of false rape, rape accusations either, but I definitely would like to point out that men are raped by men. And sometimes men probably accuse other men of, of raping each other falsely. So this is not a problem for men's rights or feminism. It's a, it's a problem for our society. and It's a problem for our legal system. It's part of the straw man fallacy that we cannot blame feminism, nor men's rights, nor anybody else for the problems of the legal system. We must put the responsibility for these things upon where it rests. Uh, my question is for Sadie. Yeah. So feminism is very inclusive of uh, trans men and people of color, so how does uh, a voice for men stand on trans men and the unique situation of black men? It has come, it has certainly covered those issues. It has come, it has included both black men and transgender men and even every every demographic you can think of as regarding the voice of men. How so? Yeah. You can find their articles posted by these people on the site. They're inclusive of those voices. And in addition, we've we have petitions, we have we have things that when we record their issues and when we help, we help. It's basically the same thing with any other issue. Uh, hey, I actually wanted to ask a question to uh, both of them. Can you do that? Yes, question both. My question was, 
I recently I got on late. My friend showed me this video of um, the Ray Rice incident, and as I was going through like the little comments, it was a whole bunch of people talking about okay, women all want you know equal rights and everything until it comes to assault and everything. Because have you seen the video? Have you I'm, the I'm sorry. Could you please repeat the name of what you're referring to? The Ray Rice incident. Ray Rice. Have you seen the video? The one, this was the one that involved the assault. It was the one the elevator. The assault in the elevator, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, my question is to both of you: in situations like that, where if a woman, unarmed or whatever, is attacking a man, and he hits her, knocks her out in self-defense, how do you feel about that? Do you feel that's okay, or do you feel that's wrong because he was a man to both of you? I, I think that self-defense is a perfectly re responsible thing to do for def for your own self-protection. But if you were to, um, but when it comes to the way that we assign responsibility to that, I would say that either we treat both we treat both men and women the same in the eyes of the law. If we don't, then I'd say that's wrong. Period. Uh, my father was a police officer for many years, and uh, he talked about an appropriate level of force. If a five-year-old is punching you in the knee, you might just grab them up by the scruff of their neck and say, "Hey, stop it, kid." If a girl called, walks up to me and smacks me. I'm gonna say, "Hey, please, let's let's not get let's not smack me anymore." You know, and I may have to turn and walk away eventually. If a girl pulls out a butterfly knife and stabs me, I might have to hit her. If a girl pulls out a gun and I have a gun, I might have to shoot her. I would hate to do any of these things, and I've never laid my hands on any woman. But these are the type of appropriate levels of response that police officers are trained to. That's why they'll use the taser before they use the pepper spray. And if that poor young lady hit Ray Rice, I'm sure that she didn't do half the damage that he did to her. This is for a sage. If you 
say that feminism got it wrong. What is your suggestion for feminism to get it right? Do you think the ideology is just wrong at its core, or just what has happened to it today? I would say that the ideology is wrong at its core, and such that it assume, presumes the existence of male hegemony, that is the hegemonic masculinity, the presumption of men, male malice, and that men in power are representative of the male attitude and male behavior in general. I mean, if you look at things like Valerie Salamis and her scum manifesto, and you look at the words of Andrea Torkin and all that, you do see, from the beginnings, a very vitriolic reaction to men. Now, regarding to your question, how can feminism get it right, I would say there would have to be an element of the movement with a systemic presence that can hold accountable the feminists that are causing harm today. If, for every feminist attacking somebody in public, was met with a feminist saying, hey, don't do that, then I think that this would spell a much more, a movement with much more integrity. But the only feminists I've seen with that kind of attitude don't have that level of pull. They are what uh, Karen Strong, also known as Girl Rights What, calls coffee shop feminists. The ones who believe in egalitarian sentiment and who understand that the feminist movement has done awful things systematically, but does not have any capacity to correct. So, feminism would get it right if it had that capacity, but I don't think it does. Uh, my question is, is similar to the previous one, um, and it would be for both of you. Um, do either of you see there uh, a continuation of, of issues that feminism can address? Um, you, you've each acknowledged uh, the effectiveness of feminism, at least in the past, if not now. Um, what issues still exist that feminism might be able to address now effectively, and what might that look like? Well, I do know that if you were to look, if you were to look around at the enforcement of gender roles through a dogmatic adherence to Abrahamic scripture, that that kind of religious influence and the imposition of gender roles, that is something that movements like feminism could certainly address. And I do agree that there are issues that are going to be facing women and men. That is always going to be the case. The world's not perfect. But I don't think that feminism is the best way to do it, personally, because feminism in its systemic form has shown that it's not really good at it. It's basically the long short of that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to repeat the question. Do you think there's ideology, do you think feminism as an ideology can do things good? Is that, was that the question, I'm sorry? No, the, the the, the question is, what issues exist right now that feminism might be effective at addressing, and how might it do that? Sexual assault, domestic abuse, equality of pay, um, political power. I'd like to remind you that most senators, most governors, most presidents, oh, oh yeah, all presidents have been male. All vice presidents have been male. Um, I mean, there's education, economics, political stuff. Uh, I'm, I mean, there is a, that would, this would create such a long list of things that I think that feminism could help. And again, I'm an advocate of feminism because I have two daughters whom I love very, very much. I would hate to live in a world where their vote didn't count. I would hate to live in a world where they weren't being paid the same as another man. I would hate to live in a world where my daughter, Kozak, couldn't be president of the United States. And feminism has paved the way for all of these things. I have a question for Sage. Who said that? In feminist circles, We've tackled a lot of issues that feminism has gotten wrong. For a long time, there was a lot of trans misogyny and exclusion of women of color. Those are problems that feminism face. Uh, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Could you speak up a little bit? I'm trying to. <laughs> no, that's fine. Okay. Feminism has been tackling the problems that it has. In the second wave of feminism, we primarily focused on white, middle class women. And now that's branched out. The problems with the men's rights movement are a bit more widespread. You ignore them. the perpetrators. Is it not a men's problem that most of the mass shooters are white males? 
or that most rapists are men? How is that not a men's issue? I would say, there, again, I'd have to disagree with the premise of your question because of the presumption of male malice. But when it comes to, there are the school shootings regarding the predominance of men, men who perform those shootings. Of course we would hold those people accountable under the fullest extent of the law. And that's not just a gendered thing. If somebody were to do something that disgusting, then of course accountability would be demanded. Now one of the things that I have been making a point of in this debate was that feminists had the opportunity to hold their own accountable when they've done something wrong, but yet nobody has asked you, isn't that a feminist issue that most feminists and scholarships censor and threaten scholars with bombs? Nobody's asked you that question. And what does that tell you? It, the, the, and I'll, I'll go ahead and also add another thing here. In the, uh, here in the men's movement, if somebody were to become, say, something misogynistic, especially under a voice for men or KSU men, and they do something that is bigoted or illegal, they get kicked out immediately. They're held accountable. And that level of policing integrity, making sure that we are consistent with our purported goals and values, is something that's very important to us. But feminism has not done. That's one of the, that's something we've got to be clear on if we're going to have an objective discussion about this. I have a second part to my question. Sure. You seem to be focusing on individualized cases say these feminist elite that they're in charge of all this stuff, you're ignoring the fact that most of the domestic violence and things that are occurred primarily by men are a cultural phenomenon. It's not blaming all men. We have to look at the source. We have to look at the majority of the perpetrators. That, I mean, if you're looking at it from a sociological standpoint. I would disagree. Because if you were, I could point to the vast majority of child abuse being perpetrated by women. But I wouldn't start a campaign that would hold all women responsible for all child abuse. And I certainly wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't call it a women's issue, it's a violence issue, it's a child abuse issue. One of the things that kind of make these conversations more difficult is the fact we add a gender dimension to it when it shouldn't have been there in the first place. And, and I have to sometimes argue on that dimension because that's the kind of turf we're on. But for example, in domestic violence, people look at it as a gendered issue when it really isn't. It's a violence issue, it's a cyclical cultural habit. And to your comment about focusing on individual cases, I'm not, I, I, you've got to remember, I'm on a time limit here. I cannot cover the vast breadth of all of the things that have been done, but the, the cases I have shown you involve influential feminists in decision-making capacity who are representative of feminism in action. They're representative of how we live our lives. The majority of feminists who don't have that kind of pull all they, they, cannot, they do not have that same kind of capacity, so I cannot comment on the ideology and action based on people who do not have the decision-making power that the influential ones do. And I'm not showing you incidental feminists, again, I'm showing you influential feminists. And if we're going to be saying that our representatives in Congress or anything like that are representative of biased cultural values, then why would we suddenly change our standards when talking about feminism? That's something we also need to be aware of. We change the way we interpret things the minute we talk about feminism, but not anything else. Dr. Ruth, I think she has a question. And I'd be happy to get to her in a second. You can still first. Yes, sir. Um, this is a question for both of you. Uh, it seems that on both sides of the argument there are good and bad people, you know, people who perpetuate kind of hate speech and anger. Um, how would you suggest going about distinguishing between the two on both sides and maybe having people who are the good people of the arguments come together and have these conversations? I would say that there would have to be an objective standard by which we can evaluate and, and bad actions. I mean, the way that we've been looking at it now is we're very willing to cast blame on people just for being different from us, and that's kind of what happens whenever something new happens. I have, for example, faced harassment on this campus, which is, as I've said before, that's the reason I record, because I need to be able to protect myself in case somebody tries to harm me. And yet, when, it's, when somebody else looks at it, people say, oh, well, look, he's a spy, he's on an espionage mission, and he's out to cause harm for people, and people are intimidated by him. You can see that there's a very strong political disagreement here, but in order for us to have a discussion on these issues, then we need to be able to build an objective standard by which to have the discussion. That's why this debate is even possible. There was an agreement existing right there and then that kept us in a framework and that kept us civil in the, in the meantime.
without having to let our speculations take us to a place where reason doesn't exist. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to disagree with Sage rhetoric there. I mean, he, I mean there's, there's extremists on both sides. This young man right here pointed toward one. I can't remember the person's name. It starts with a D. Yeah, I, I read up on her and I was like, wow. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to disagree with Sage's logic here. I mean, I'm a feminist, he is not. You know, and we've come together here, we haven't yelled at each other, we've treated each other with great respect. And I think that you have to have a scholarly, intellectual, objective, you know, because where's the objectivity here? The dean of students. Because if this had been less than scholarly, I guarantee you that that man right there could call that man right there and say, let's make it scholarly. You know, I mean, so this is, this is academia. This is what we came and we pay these student fees for. This is, this is why, I mean, in the end, we pay Dr. Sanzibero's salary. And he comes and does these things for us. You know, and we're very, very grateful to you, Dr. Sanzibero, for being the objective voice here. And, uh, and I definitely appreciate him because that, this is how we do find objectivity. Does that answer your question, young man? Close. Okay, so what, what am I not answering? I think the radicals on both sides make themselves known. I think that it's intrinsically able to be distinguished. Okay, just to end, I, I'm going to have to agree with Brian there. In essence, the people, the, 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 the criteria is who's hurting people. If there's harm that can be shown and measured, then you look, you're looking at somebody who's trying to operate outside the realm of the law and reason. Okay, I said Jack a question for you as well. Um, sure. So we were talking about harassment and rape, and, and you said that, if, if I quoted this correctly, um, that through recent data that it is equal between men and women, that men and women have the same levels of domestic violence, the same levels of rape. Rates. Rates, those are men. Um, is that what you were saying? Yes. Okay, if that is true, then why did the CDC in 2014 report that one in five women have reported sexual abuse in which 60% were unreported, as well as one in 71 men were reported. Again, these, these sources come from an institutional presence and Dr. Mary Koss, who have doctored the numbers. There is publications by Dr. Murray Strauss, Dr. Susan Steinmetz, Dr. Richard Jones, and I believe there are, all, I think there are 183 studies up to this point who show, that shows gender reciprocity and domestic violence, but those are not the ones that cited in government because as it turns out, pointing out those very alarmist statistics, one in four, one in five, those are the kind of statistics that get people to donate to causes. Those are the kind of things that incite people to action. It's a profitable thing to do. And to, uh, and to uh, challenge that statistic even further, if uh, I've heard both one in four and one in five, but those proportions are so high that if you were in a population dense area, you wouldn't be able to leave your house without hearing somebody screaming in the distance. And on top of that, if you looked at, I believe right now, the country with the highest incident of rape, I could be getting this figure wrong, so forgive me if I am, was South Africa at 69 per 100,000. That's the cap. Now, now the country with the cap, if it's in a two digit per 100,000, is that one in four? Is that one in five? It's same with sexual assault. It's, you've got to remember, rape and sexual assault are deviations from the norm. They're not the norm. The statistics have been blown out of proportion. And that one in five statistic, one in four, whatever, from the CDB, CDB started, it came from a place where somebody actually went out and took women who were not raped and cast them as rape by playing with the definition. I put her picture up there. And it, she said, I'm excluding male victims of rape. And men who were raped by women, particularly. He, she included men who were raped by other men. And on top of that, she's... She just played with the definitions to get the results that she wanted in a non-scientific manner, and it went to government, and it influenced everything. Okay, then my second question would be, if we are questioning all sources, that means that no statistics in your mind, which means none of the statistics you have pulled up, 
mean anything. If we can, if, if all sources are biased? No, I'm saying that the methodology... You're saying that the CDC is biased, correct? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> that publication certainly was. Hi, John Pledger, how are you again? Uh, this is, uh, I got two questions, one for Brian, one for Sage. <clears throat> Brian, you made a comment earlier that said, um, you said most senators, governors, and all presidents are male. Are you suggesting that the democratic process itself is inherently anti-feminist or misogynistic? And I just want to finish the second question to get it out of the way. Sage, uh, you talked about how you've been harassed on campus. Is there any documentation, have you made any documentation with campus PD? Or do you have got documentation yourself of said harassment? Any of my questions? Uh, my first question, my first, um, my statement about how there were, have been no women vice presidents or presidents, and that they're poorly represented in Congress and in the halls of power and in government is a statement of fact. And you didn't answer the question. <coughs> What's the, the question then? Uh, are you suggesting that the democratic process is inherently I'm saying that the democratic process has shown its own results, and you can make that decision on your, on your own. Yes, I do have documentation. You can, you can follow up with me after this uh, event. Um, my question is for Sage. Earlier I mentioned that, um, you know, I asked you what you thought feminism could do to get it right. Um, your response was that feminism does not really focus on men. If feminism could focus more on, you know, gender equality than women, which it does, except for these extremists. Um, so if these coffee shop women feminists um, were leading it, would you say that that would be getting it right? I would say that if feminist was consistent with its purported goals, then yeah, I would say that. But it's not. The, the, um, we, we've, uh, there has been suggestions around here that um, if I've been again focusing on the extremists and not the mainstream, but that's backwards. I have been focusing on the mainstream. The, the, even though they might not be the majority, feminism is actually not a majority position to begin with. The Washington Post reported that 17% of American women identified as feminists, and I believe it was 20% men. And that shows us that, again, feminism is not even a majority position in society, in civilization. But when we get to the ones who actually do things, who actually get into the system, who influence policy, who influence law, and then we see, again, the ideology in action. And that, I think, shows that when they don't do anything that's consistent with their proposed virtues and their promises, then they got it wrong. If that was the other K way around and they got it right, then they got it right. Hi, I'm Carlin. I'm co-president and founder of Yes Body. Hey. Hey. Um, I've been told that um, members of my organization take quotes from Paul Alam and ADFM out of context because they're from satirical articles. Um, I'm a big fan of satire, and I think I understand it pretty thoroughly. But most of the time, the point of satire is to point at something that's not being looked at in the opposite way that Paul Alam does. And the threat of rape to a woman is the oldest way of silencing a woman. So I'm just wondering what exactly the purpose of writing satire about something that's so apparent in our society, what, what's the purpose of that? And can you explain how that's satire in the first place? Well, actually, Paul Elam, when he wrote his satirical articles, they were satire in the sense that you described. They pointed to something that we don't look at often. And I'll give you a perfect example of this. Now, Paul, for, before I get to that example, note that Paul Elam writes something called juvenalian satire. What juvenalian satire is, is the same kind of satire you can find in A Clockwork Orange, 1984, and pretty much anything that Mark Twain writes. Because it's the kind of satire that uses savage sarcasm as a means to, uh, to either, to, to just bring a lot of shame and ridicule to something that's corrupted. And a while back, Jezebel, a feminist publication, published an article about how awesome it was basically to beat your husbands and boyfriends. It was promoting domestic abuse. Now what Paul Elam's response to this was, was he said, let's see what happens when, the, when we write the ex that exact same article but make women the subject of it. He did, so he wrote something called, I declare October to be bash a violent bitch month. And he's talking about, he used Jezebel's pretty much own form of argument and said, 
And basically, he had to leave a disclaimer saying, look, this is satire. I don't mean anything I'm saying. But yet, people got angry at him, but not Jezebel. It shows you that when people talk about women and make them the subject of very sexist language, people get upset. But when people do it uh, to men, it's a subject of comedy. It's a, something that people do like. So Paul Elam, the quotes that you've been concerned about, he doesn't mean anything he says if it's supposed to be hateful. It's supposed to be satire. That's what satire is. But the fact that he wrote it shows you that, and the way that we responded to it shows you the cultural bias we have about men and women. And if you, and again, if you were to take issue with the subject matter, the fact that it was about rape or something like that, comedians have always talked about dark topics like that. Comedians have talked about necrophilia, they've talked about a lack of freedom, they've talked about tyranny, but all of a sudden, only when it gets to feminist territory do people get weird. That it's, again, it shows you the level of emotional investment we have in it, even though the satire is pretty much the same. So again, and if you have any concerns about anything Paul Elam says, and you've seen quotes that, yes, have been taken out of context, then you can actually see him yourself at our conference coming to November 1st. He's going to be here, folks. He's going to be speaking. And he will be happily taking questions at the end of his presentation. And again, RSVP, you can see all the information you need to RSVP on the Student Center banner. I'm a bit confused because of the uh, switch between feminist and feminism, so I'd like to know your definition of feminism, the ideology. Feminism as an ideology is what social context sets it to be. So in essence, to give you an idea, if you looked at a hundred years ago... I'm not asking about social context, I'm asking about your definition of feminism. It's whatever social context it is. That is an answer, and here's why. If you go to, uh, if you looked at republicanism or being Democrat a hundred years ago, is that the same thing as being a Republican or Democrat today? It, it, everything changes with the time, including ideology. And people define feminism by looking at the dictionary. And that seems like the intuitive thing to do. But I don't use that definition. And the reason is, if I were to uh, get, grab a fork and then look up the definition of fork, the definition matches the object I'm holding. It describes it. But if feminism is always changing, why, if, if I'm looking at something that's always changing, why would I look at a static definition? That makes no sense. So I define feminism according to the sum total of the institutional and individual actions of those who claim to be a part of that ideology. And that definition changes over time. So that's when I was, when I was answering her question over there, she said, would I say that feminism got it right? If they got it right, th then yes, I would change my mind. Because the definition, the way that we would verify feminism, look at its actions, would have changed. Your recordings are for your own um, safety. Why are you publishing them and not reporting them to the police? Because when, uh, because for one thing, when I'm publishing advocacy work where I am not actually threatened, which is thankfully most of the time, what I do is I uh, go back to our sponsors and donors because KSU Men gets donors from all over the globe. And so whenever I have an update, they need to kind of know what's going on. It's basically kind of like updating like a blog or whatever. And, um, but if you were to look at recordings, I always redact private information personal to state law. So there's no any, there, I've, ne I've never done anything like that. But when it comes to the things that have been a threat to me, I have taken that up actually with Dr. Sansevero, and I have taken it to the school's attention. But the, the, when it comes to police attention, I have not been in a situation where somebody has pinned me down and threatened my life, not yet anyway. So I haven't needed to contact the police quite yet. Everyone, we appreciate you coming out today. Please gather your things. Um, AU is responsible for cleaning up everything here. San Severo has a place to be at 3 o'clock. Uh, we have to tear down all this equipment. We appreciate you coming out, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thank you very much.